All right, well, it's 630, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for coming and spending a couple hours of your evening with us. Um, I'm Rachel Young, and I'm here with Rachel O'Donnell from M Agency. We will be facilitating the event this evening. So just a couple of housekeeping items before I pass it off to the big show. Um, we are going to be using the Q&A feature to ask questions. And we're going to be using the chat just if you have any um, technical issues or if you have anything that you need Rachel or I to help you with, um, go ahead and use the chat for that. But if you have a question for our presenters, um, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Walt and he is going to kick us. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Walt Birdsall, and I work for the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. Um, we also have with us tonight Bree Ellis from the city of Gig Harbor, and Bree is a stormwater engineering technician. And we also have uh, Todd Smith from the University Place, the city of Uni University Place, and he is the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System Coordinator, long title there. But I just wanted to uh, say that because that's the reason why we're, we do these workshops. Um, we partner with the health department partners with the city of Gig Harbor and University Place because we don't, we only want rain to go down the drain, down the storm drain. We don't want pollution to go down there. So in other words, things like pesticides and herbicides that you might use on your yard uh, on a rainy day like this, it actually will wash off into the street, down into the, into the uh, storm drain and end up in our streams lakes soak into our groundwater and perhaps become uh, part of our drink get into our drinking water or eventually you know out to Puget Sound so we always say Puget Sound starts here and that means anywhere you are Puget Sound starts anything that's spilled on the ground or put on the ground where you are it's going to eventually get down to the sound so uh, we're very excited to have uh, Sue Getz with us tonight and she is a great speaker and great uh, has she'll really inspire us for our yards and she has all kinds of great information to give us so uh, welcome and uh, thank you for for being here tonight awesome thank you walt and and thanks for joining us everybody um i hope you got a warm cup of tea i have mine over here because it's that kind of day right so um, I'm going to dive right in. Um, unless Todd or um, Bree want to say anything, should I just jump right in? <laughs> I got the thumbs up. I'll take it. Thank you so much. So here we go. Let's just get started with what, what we're going to be inspired with tonight. At least that's my goal to inspire you. So this is really about um, small gardens, abundant spaces. That was the title. And I want to inspire you not only by the size of the garden, but also by the nurturing and the care of the garden. So, so that's what we're, we're going to really walk through tonight. And, um, and remember, the, the, the question and answer chat box you see down at the bottom of your screen, uh, we're going to have time at the end of my chatter and photos to, to take some question and answer. So save those. and and them in there and, and we'll go through those with you. Um, we, we've saved some time at the end to do that. So let's just get off to, to what we want to talk about tonight. Uh, really, this is about gardening anywhere and maybe you're downsizing, maybe you um, are trying to make less work for yourself. It's a smaller space, whatever it may be. And maybe all you have is that cute little pot on the windowsill. You are a gardener, or maybe it's this, this cool balcony. Maybe that's all you have is what the herbs by the, the barbecue. So, so whatever you have, I, I want to help you discover that space a little bit more and how you care and nurture and, and really how you take care of it all. And, and so we're gonna talk about small spaces and lots about container gardens, because that's, that's a pretty good topic to really downsize your life, but still create abundance and that's the goal is the abundance and so i can tell you you know i'm going to dive into some spaces to, for you to look at but i want you to get in your head for just a minute and look at what your space would do and and what it is because i can talk about sunny spaces i can talk about shady spaces but 
with all of you here, I, I want to, you know, I can't direct and focus to what each individual person has. So you need to go there in your head with me a little bit and kind of look at what is your space to grow or what do you want to downsize it to be? Maybe that's, that's kind of the thing we're looking at. And really what I want to say is don't set limits uh, uh, on yourself because I don't have any space. I can't grow a pumpkin or, or whatever. I think that's really unfair to give yourself a limit until you start to really discover what is your space. And so I'm going to give you some kind of thinking points and, and we will get to pretty pictures here in a minute, but I really want you to kind of look at some, some, some things to think about in your space. And, and then we'll really start to dive into to what we can do in that space. So is your space hot or cold? Is there a microclimate sunshade? There's some logistics we need to talk about a little bit and you go on that discovery. Um, I think one of the biggest things is a lot of people say, well, I, I don't know if I have enough sun for a tomato or a rosemary or whatever. And I always say kind of throw away the plant tag and um, look at what your quality of light might be. Maybe it's not six solid hours of sun a day, but you have really nice quantity of light that comes in maybe in the morning and it's hot and it's warm and it's against a brick wall that gathers lots of heat. So start looking at some of those things that maybe you could steal a little space in your, in your landscape that could become your micro garden, your pocket garden, whatever it is. And so looking kind of into your space and today you're going to walk out and it's dreary. So this is a really good time to plan because you, you know, all the weeds aren't screaming at you so hard because it's just too miserable to be out working in there. And so let's do a little bit of planning. And one of the, the things too is logistics. And you're going to hear a lot of it as, as we buzz through some slides tonight um, is logistics, how you get water to a space. If all you have is a balcony, how are you going to water your containers or you know however you're planting up there yeah. if you're on a rooftop it's the same question yes. you know how do you get potting soil up to the roof and is it go up the elevator or whatever so think about all of those moving parts so that you're not frustrated in the end when you're planning and thinking now what do i do right what can i do if it's just that so we're going to talk about design for a minute and is it big or small? Well, we're talking about small, but I want it to be big on thought and big on design. And that's really what it is. It isn't, okay. you have to be this kind of ultra designer, but that you kind of take on the, the thinking through of a plan and how you're going to really kind of move forward and get all of this done. And so let's kind of go through what a plan will also help you do besides pick pretty plants because to me, the plants are the given. It's a garden. We're growing. And we'll talk about more what we can grow. But what about the planning and the designing is it's opportunity to me to think through like, how is water in your garden? What does water do in your garden? Where does it go in your garden? And also easy care, low maintenance. You, I'm going to really highlight each one of these in the next few slides. But these are the things that I want you to think about when you're designing. And and, and at some point you might say, well, that's, that's not the fun part. I just want to go pick out plants and go to the nursery. And me too, really, me too. But really we need to think about some of these other things. So let's go through some of those things like water in the garden. So here's the, here's the groundbreaking news for you all. And, and you know this, all gardens need water. There's just simply that said, some just don't use as much water and some need a little bit more water. And so those are the kinds of things you need to discover. So you need to be smart about um, what water is in your garden and, and where it goes and how it's being used. And, um, and also uh, where it goes when we don't need it. Um, like right now, the water running into the storm drains, um, is there a way to bring that into your garden? Um, you know, there's lots of things to think about of what water is in the garden. And so when you're thinking on a small scale, then you need to think about the things that make water more efficient in a small space. And so some really uh, bullet points of a healthy water wise garden, and you're going to see healthy soil and you're going to see soil on every bullet list that you see that we go through, you're going to hear it over and over and over. I want you to really take it all in. What is soil to the garden? Um, but also watering practices. So 
there's a lot of pictures on this side, but in the lower corner, you can see a sidewalk. And I was taking a morning walk uh, one day, and this was in Idaho, so it was um, very dry climate. And here's this sprinkler system hardly hitting the, the grass and the tree, obviously, in the, the parking strip. It's all in the sidewalk. I'm slopping through it as I'm trying to take my walk. And I remember just thinking, y'all need to fix your sprinkler. Something's going on here. And so really taking a look at all of that and making sure that you're, you're taking care. If you have a watering system that it's running very efficiently, there's not broken lines, there's not a nozzle spraying down the driveway, you know, all of those things. And then if it's you, you're the watering system at the end of the hose, um, are you being really efficient in getting water where it should be and getting enough of it? Um, these are just really easy questions to answer when you start thinking about how you water the garden. And then plant choices, we'll talk about plants, but plant choices, if you plant in a garden that you don't want to have to water, you want nature to really be the watering, then you're gonna choose plants that don't require a lot of water. If you have a wet spot in the garden, there's a lot of um, natural springs in Tacoma. And so you'll see wet areas that are just always wet, even when you don't water. And so making plant choices of, of things that will grow well in a moist environment. And so you have to really think through all of those things. And then water collection and direction. And I have some photos as we get through the slideshow of what that really kind of alludes to, but can you collect water and force it back into the garden like with dry stream beds? Uh, right now out of my garden, I'm pointing to it. You're not seeing it. I do wish you were here to see it someday. Um, I have a, a dry stream bed that all of my downspouts are piped into. So the water then off the roof perks back into my landscape. It gives it back to my garden rather than running into the storm drain. And so right now it's full of water because it's got a lot of rain today, but it's been very dry over the last month. But it's really, I'm telling water where I would like it to go. And so you can, if you can think of ways to do that and really look into that, like is it a rain garden, a rain barrel, all of those things, that's a, that's a whole nother talk. We can do that another time. But really thinking about what water is in the garden and, and really thinking through it very carefully. And then the other thing on a, a garden that is small is a lot of people say, I'm downsizing because I don't want to maintain a big garden. And I never, ever have a client who tells me they want a high maintenance garden. There's, that's just not what they do. They want it low maintenance. And so what is a low maintenance garden? And I usually ask people when they say, I want low maintenance, it's like, what is your pain point of maintenance? Um, is I find weeding very therapeutic. I'm weird, I know that, but I, I, I'm okay with it. It's not, a, it's not a task to me that I really struggle with. I just go out and do it because it's, it's what I do. And so here's some things that you can do to try to talk about a low maintenance garden. If you're downsizing and you want it to be easy to take care of, here's that healthy soil again. You're gonna see it again. I'm gonna talk more about it and good mulch habits. I'm gonna go into that in a minute. So I'm gonna bump right to weed control. A weed control in a, in a small garden especially, but even in a large space, if that's what you're dealing with. Um, weed control means you're, you're the boss. You're the boss of the weeds. You're not letting them get out of hand. You're not letting them take over. You're realizing how you take care of them and it's really removing them minus chemical use because we don't want that back into our gardens. We don't want that into our water streams. And so how can you get control of weeds? Weeds happen and they're in every garden. I don't really see any expert gardener getting away with a weed-free garden. So you really need to kind of get ahead of it and make sure that you're maintaining it when they blow in, when there's a little bit in the lawn or whatever, get out, dig it out, get it out of there. Don't let it go to seed. It's really kind of how you manage that a little bit. And then in, in a low maintenance garden is reducing repetitive tasks. If there's something that you go out and do that you hate to do and it's a task in the garden that you dislike and well, I think mine is weed whacking. I hate weed whacking. That's just, it's a repetitive task to me that I don't wanna do. And so think about how you can eliminate if it's weed whacking. If, if you don't wanna whack weeds along a fence, then maybe you need to put a planting border there so that you don't have to whack out the lawn that's trying to creep in or what's a repetitive task that you can maybe figure out how to design out of your life rather than 
design harder into your life. And then defining and fixing problems. And really that's just a bigger, like if you have poor drainage, then you're going to have a struggling garden, plants that are struggle, and then the maintenance will be a problem because you're struggling to maintain a very damp, wet place and plants keep dying. And so what can you do to fix that? What can you do to fix any problems in your garden that are really causing you to have to maintain something a little bit more than it should be? And it's, it's like, you know, kind of covering ground with plants, all of those things, and then right plant, right place. That's another kind of repeated theme you will see through a lot of this is putting a right plant in the right place. And I know you've heard it if you're a gardener, uh, don't put that big plant and say, oh, I'll keep it pruned. No, you won't. I, I mean, it's just, it, 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 I, I really rarely see somebody who keeps up after it. Or if you're going to move out of your house and someone else has to maintain it, they might not. And so really defining and fixing a, a wrong plant is like if you have to keep trimming the roadie so you can find the front door, then the roadie has to go. It has to be transplanted, removed, get out of the way and stop pruning it and stop giving yourself that maintenance issue because it's the wrong plant in the wrong place, or right plant, wrong place, whatever you want to call it, because it's, you know, it's probably a pretty darn nice plant. It's just in your way, causing you have to maintain it. So those are some things you can think about when you're talking about um, downsizing, creeping down, what kinds of things can you do, choosing right plants that don't overgrow the space, that kind of thing. And so now we're going to bump heads with, with dirt a little bit here. Um, Soil in your garden is absolutely imperative. It's, it's the vitality of your garden. And there's times when I've walked into clients' landscapes and they want me to tell them a list of pretty plants and they want to make everything beautiful again. And I'm over off the side kicking their soil going, nope, we're starting here. You've got to get some amendment down. You've got to get this soil happy again so that plants can do well and really kind of thinking through. So make sure that you understand if your soil needs some amendment, some nourishment, what does it need to keep it healthy and vital? I remember um, sitting in a talk, and if you you might have heard me say this if you've been in any of the talks, but I was sitting in a talk of, of two uh, very sweet ladies from England about the purchasing of a house. They were kind of essaying their garden um, in this talk, and they said before they would sign the papers to buy it, they had to have a soil test because they knew that they were going to garden there and the soil was as important as I think if the toilets flushed or whatever you do when you look at buying a house, I mean, how important is the soil in your garden? It's vital. And so looking at how you keep it healthy and, and keep it to where water gets into it instead of just runs off the top because it's so and, and all of those things because you ask plants to live in that and that's what they need to do. And so what happens when you kind of have this healthy soil, it makes healthy plants. That's what it does. And then healthy plants fight disease and pests. So where are you at in all of that? That means you're not having to, to go out and maintain something because it's diseased or it has pests. You're not having to use some sort of control um, because you want to keep it a healthy garden, you're going to do something organic, you're going to have healthy plants. Start there. Start with healthy soil and healthy plants, and you will get there. And this will be a much easier maintenance mode. Downsizing and making this abundance in a small way. Um, and mulch in the garden, to me, is, is, is another kind of, uh, it can be a mystery to some, like, what the heck is it? And, and um, you know, is it compost? Is it bark? Is it wood chips? oyster shells, which is the picture you see around the lavender here, um, it's actually all of the above. It's a material that you put on the surface of the soil, and it can be something organic that breaks down, that nurtures the soil, like compost. It can be bark. It can be wood chips, which is that pile was, it is a picture of it in my yard, and I thought I'd, when it landed from a truck, I was like, I'm so grateful to have this. I'll take this any day. No diamonds for me. I need a pile of wood chips. And so kind of what can you do to kind of get a mulch program going? Because really what mulch does is, is a little bit magical in your garden. So when you lay down 
kind of that frosting on the cake, the frosting over the soil and the plants and that kind of thing, it helps to hold moisture in the soil. And so what you'll find in periods of dry, droughty summer weather, which we are just passing through now, um, plants that had good mulch down, good healthy mulch, were able to hold moisture against the soil and probably work their way better through the droughtiness before you got water to them. And then it also helps with soil erosion. So if you're trying to keep soil from riveting off in this crazy rains that are on their way for our winter, um, then you want to have a nice mulch layer down. And then weed suppression, you know, going back to how we control weeds so we don't have to maintain it, um, putting a mulch down so that you can suppress weeds and really give them a, a good three inch layer of stuff they don't have to, a weed will have a hard time making it through that. So if you give it a good layer of mulch and suppression. And then compost and amendments, this is on there as well, is, is really adding nutrition and good healthy microbial activity back to the soil. Compost will do that, wood chips will do that, these organic substances will do that. And then aesthetics. I mean, when you look at this photo, I mean, that beautifully kind of popped bed as it was planted. So it looks very lovely and, and just kind of ready. And another aspect of mulch, sometimes it's not necessarily organic. It really depends on the surface that you're trying to uh, cover and why you're wanting to cover it. So you can see if you even container garden, this is some beach glass on top of, actually it's a bulb container that I had tulips in. And so I put the beach glass on for a couple of reasons. because It's really pretty. It's just a nice cobalt blue, but I can top it when the bulbs are still underground and the bulbs will emerge through the glass, but also the squirrels and the slugs don't like that glass. And so they tend to leave what's in the container alone. And so you can kind of do double duty. This is a type of mulch and then you see gravel, um, you know, that's, gravel's a really great mulch if that's your aesthetic. You have to kind of like it. It's not for everybody, but for uh, real drought tolerant plants, Mediterranean kind of rosemaries, lavenders, things like that. Gravel's really a great mulch to kind of keep moisture from getting up into the, the, the around the plant. And, and if they don't like moisture and they like it to and then I love this terracotta mulch you can put down to suppress weeds and just add a decorative edge. Here's that like take away the weed whacking moment, put down uh, terracotta pots. I had quite a, quite a few blow in the windstorm a couple of weeks ago. So I, I have some mulch material. You can look at it that way. Um, and so kind of, you know, th that's another aspect of a garden that you're growing. And then sustainability. This is a question that I would ask is when you're designing, your space, downsizing it, making it small, whatever it may be. Are you planning it to be a garden year after year? It just gets better and better. And, and that and then you're planning for that and not just kind of throwing in a, a planter and hoping the tomato will grow. How about we throw in a garden that you know every year you will put something there, whether it's you know, herbs or tomatoes or whatever. Um, so planning for longevity in the garden is a really big deal. And this is what we're doing right now is it's getting into fall and colder. We're not out in the garden so much. Start thinking about things that you can do that, that maybe it's like, well, that's failing. Maybe I need to do something a little bit different. Um, and then I wanted to make a quick note about this photo that you see. So this is um, a really great way to see how you would guide water. So when the water is coming off of that uh, non-permeable surface, which is the brick, and you can kind of see a slab of concrete and everything. So the water then can go into this rockery down the center and the water then perks back into the landscape rather than flushing off the hard surface and going down into the storm drain or whatever. It's actually going back into the landscape, but it's actually a really nice design look as well. And so kind of that sustainability mode. And then the next one is personality. Um, you need to put yourself in this and you'll see some of this come through as we see some photos of gardens. But here's the thing I wanna ask, what side are you on? Are you the lawn side or are you the wonderful perennial community side? Now I should have said, are you the wonderful lawn person? But then I shouldn't throw bias at you because sometimes it's the lawn person and you're good with that. You'd rather just get out a mower. That is your low maintenance garden. 
Um, and maybe it's, it's the other side. It's this beautiful bank of perennials that are also pollinator friendly and all of those things. You can choose sides. You can have both, but in a small garden, you may not have the room for it. Whichever side you're on, I want you to go backwards into those slides we just talked about. What are the best practices that you can do in your garden and for the environment? So if you're, if you're doing lawn, then you need to really talk about a healthy lawn that's getting watered properly because a healthy lawn will survive um, and not have to have a chemical on it. It will be healthier if it's got healthy soil in the beginning when you put it down and then it's also watered and cared for um, very well. So, so think about which part of the personality that you are because sometimes um, people look at this and like, yeah, I would rather, if I have a small garden, which one do you want? Pick one. Um, and then you'll find um, really how to design it and what you're really, really wanting out of it. Um, and so now we're gonna kind of bump a little bit into some garden spaces. So this is a little bit more, I hope, inspiring. You know, hopefully we'll kind of walk through tiny spaces that have been made into magical spaces. So putting your designer hat on for just a little. So if you are looking at a small space and you want to design it, or you have a small space and you're a little stuck, it's fine, but there's something's missing, not sure what it is. So here's some simple rules for to play with the illusion and scale, I'm going to show you pictures of each one of these. I'm just going to run through this list quick and then I'm going to give you the visual behind it. But illusion and scale is, is really like big things, small things, you know, distant things. Does the neighbor have a beautiful tree that you could use as your focal point? Put something on your side of the property that makes that beautiful up above. And then in small spaces, you do not have the luxury to ignore spaces. You need to design every square inch. Uh, you want to take advantage of every square inch, whatever it is. Um, and I'll show you an example of that. And then be selfish, give in to your needs. If, is this sweet little chair in the garden your space? Because that's where you want to sit down and read a book. Um, what is your needs? Do you have a, do you need a space for children to play or to barbecue or whatever, define those things so that you can see how you can fit them into a small space. And then planting with a purpose. I'm going to show you that as we go, but really, really thinking through what you're planting and why. What is the purpose? Is it for, food? Is it for health of the garden? There's lots of things. And then there's that darn thing I keep saying, making good plant Know, things that don't overgrow, all of those things. So here's a little bit of bump of inspiration. So don't be afraid in small spaces to use big things, like this piece of pottery. Um, I'm five foot three. If I stand next to that, that's about the size of the pot. And um, I mean, you could hide in there. It's so big. And so, but it's in a very small space. I love the drama of this. So I think some people would look at that pot and go, well, that'll never fit. But look what it does for this beautiful little intimate piece of art. So don't be afraid of big texture because what I find um, people just say, oh, okay, everything's dwarf. I'll get a dwarf, you know, this flower's dwarf, that shrub's dwarf, this tree's dwarf. And then they've created clutter. It's just clutter to have lots of little tiny plants everywhere. It's maybe a few well chosen plants and a beautiful piece or something like that that just really um, kind of expresses a visual or expresses just a way to surround yourself. So don't be afraid to go big, big, big in a small space. I think that's one of the, the hardest things people do is they just make everything miniature and then it's clutter. So this is a little bit of an illusion play and I love it. I took this years ago at a home in Seattle. I was on a garden tour and so this is the outside of the home. It's the courtyard. Um, there's the front doors there on the right. And what you see here, and I'm gonna, I think you can see my cursor, this right here is actually a mirror. And so the mirror is reflecting back into the garden. So it makes the garden space look bigger, doesn't it? It just really kind of pulls you in, but it's actually just a simple mirror embedded on this outside of the chimney house and so then it kind of adds beauty to what sometimes chimneys aren't so attractive but also I just love what it does it bounces light back into the space 
and makes it feel much bigger. And, and so play with a little bit of illusion. Is it a mirror? Is it a big pot? Is it, you know, big, small kind of scale? Um, think about those kinds of things that you can do. So this is a garden in Tacoma. And um, if the homeowners in the audience, yay, I'm showing your, your garden. I won't say who it is. If, if you're not, I'm, she's just wonderful and gracious. But this was, this is a real good example of every square inch matters. This is a very tiny sweep. And um, I think the width her home to the neighbor's home. This is one of those, those community neighborhoods where you know, houses are just right there on property lines. And so the neighbor's home is to the right and her back door is on the left. And so what I was called out to do is to really work through this dilemma with her. There was a hot tub in this crazy space right there. The hot tub is no longer there, obviously. And so she was left with this gaping hole and it was hogging up so much of this space and she wanted a garden as well. And so um, we came up with a solution, but I really had to walk the space and not ignore any little nook or cranny that we could maybe utilize to give her more space in a very confined space. And so what we did, you can see here's the before, again in the tiny and here's the after. And so when you kind of look a little closer at the after, this is that hole. This is actually a deck built over the old hot tub hole. And then we put in this wall. And what I want to say about the wall is I call it, it's the, about the height of a behind. So you could sit down on it. It's a seating wall. So if company's over, they can sit on the wall and, and you know, set their food down a tray of food or whatever. And, and have a bigger entertaining space out of a very tiny space before. So we maximized kind of the seating and really just put a deck over that hole so that that became an actual surface that could be walked on. And then the lushness of her garden is just well beyond that wall. It drops down behind. So you can see the hydrangea and some, some, uh, some maple tree. And there's a, I believe that's a golden, raindrops malice. So there's just this nice lush texture that still feels like a really big garden on the other side. Here's another shot of it as it goes. This is kind of flipped around looking the other direction. You can see the wall and then the gate. So you also see how tiny it is. And so had we ignored this sort of garden space, this sort of hot tub space, we wouldn't have been able to maximize the rest of the space. And so you might have to think outside of the box a little bit. If your garden is tiny and you're just not sure what to do with it, what is the tiny part that you can attack and really bring maximum space back to it? If that's your thing. Her thing was if I have family over or friends over and we will get to having friends over again. I cannot wait. Um, but when we can meet in person again, is that your garden? And, and how do you find the space to do that? Now, had she said, um, okay, I just want everything to be a garden. Well, we probably would have talked about pulling more of that patio out, but that's not what she wanted. So give in to what you want, give in to your needs. Here's a few things to just remember in small, small spaces. What you want to add is rhythm and repetition, and you can really see that very well by this variegated hosta that's running the edge. So it's not in this small courtyard, this front entry is not like. 20 different plants all piled in there just because, 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 because we wanted all the plants in there. It's actually three well chosen plants. There's a hedge, and then there's the little dwarf grody hedge, and then there's a little hedge of the variegated hosta. So, what you see is these three well chosen plants repeated. It makes the space feel expansive and not cluttered. It doesn't make your eye crazy to look at it all. And so, how do you add those kinds of things? into a small space. And what you're removing out of the space is failing plants and structures. I'm gonna give you kind of some tough love permission if you are keep nurturing that ugly, I'm gonna pick on a Fesky or an Andina because they tend to have their moments of ugly. If you're gonna pick on those things and, and just say someday it'll look better, maybe it's time to let it go. Maybe it's, it, your space is too small to be nurturing um, ugly plants. So, you know, remove things that just don't, don't make you happy anymore. That kind of Marie Kondo kind of, if it doesn't strike joy, then get rid of it. 
and clutter. And then also maintenance. You can see this lower photo. This was this was a, a before that was just the maintenance issue had just everything had just been let go. And also these weren't appropriate plants for this sort of space. So then it just became an absolute jungle that no one could really enjoy. And that was the problem. And really bringing on the joy part is how you personalize your space. Again, like we talked about um, the lady with the, the seating wall that we put in. So if your joy is sitting out in a garden, then give it to lots of seating. Um, you know, if it's entertaining or whatever, I love this. I, I just want to curl up in those pillows every day. And if that's your thing, then give that back to the space and use containers or smaller things to kind of, you know, enhance the garden with those things and, and use, use the space to its maximum and, and how you personalize it. So making it your own, it's really, really important. Don't make it because it was pretty in a magazine. Make it because you love it and you want it. And that's what you should do. And so then another kind of real reasoning in, in designing a small space is purpose. I mean, what is the purpose of the planting or the lawn? Or again, what is the purpose of the space? Was it the seating, but maybe you want to attract more pollinators to the garden? Uh, maybe you want to grow more food. I have lots of plants to show you that you can grow small spaces and how you can really tuck in those things if you thought you couldn't have a veg garden or you couldn't have a pollinator garden or something, you can. You just really need to think through the space and how you do it. And so here's just a, a quick sketch of, of a pollinator pocket garden is what I call it. It's, it's really only a 10 by 10 space. And so what we've done is put in, what I've drawn on here is some plants that really the pollinators just really dive into, bee balm and, and hyssop and flower and all of those things. But here's the, the thing I want you to see about this, this pocket garden, because you could plant all of those plants and you would be fine, but you need a bench out front, right? A little place to sit so that when you're in your space on a quiet day, a, a, a summer day, afternoon, you're trying to find a quiet space, you sit there and the butterflies are coming in and the pollinators are coming in, you get to enjoy the show. And so put a bench out there so that you a little quick inspiration sketch. Another one, if you want a butterfly garden, again, don't limit and think you have to have this massive amount of plants. What you need to have is enough plants that the pollinators are drawn to. But also I want you to see a little bit of repetition in here. It's only an eight by eight space. I kind of sketched it out, but there's there's like a few Rudbeckias, there's a you know a couple of echinaceas, there's some repetition in here not only for aesthetics, but it's interesting when you read about what attracts pollinators to a garden, they don't like all the clutter either. They're drawn into big, bold swaths of color. So repeating plants like side by side where the plants are just really these bold swaths of color instead of a purple this and a pink that and an orange this and you know one of this, one of that. This is a really good call out for buying more than one plant, buying three or whatever, um, that will be an attractor for, for butterfly gardens. And so then you found a purpose, you're giving this space a purpose. And so here's, um, we're gonna kind of go back into a design moment. Um, this is a space, again, in Tacoma. Um, and what this is, that is that, I want you to look at that parking strip, that grass strip where the hydrant is. Um, some people also fondly call it the hell strip because it's just that thing like, what do we do with this? Do you want lawn? Is that your, your thing and you mow it? That's fine. These uh, clients did not want lawn. They wanted to repurpose that space because they weren't fans of a lot of lawn. It wasn't their thing. They didn't like what they had to do to take care of it. And so they wanted to be a little more earth friendly and create a different space. And so what here is at planting. And what you can see is what we've started with is patches of mulched areas. And then we also have rock. And so what I want you to see specifically about the rock is when the water flushes off the sidewalk, it's not necessarily just running into a stream. It's actually flushing into these pieces of gravel. And so then you're guiding water back into the landscape beautifully 
without having the soil erode away out of that um, parking strip area. And so you can, you can see the hydrant in the back. So it's, it's all here, but um, I wanted you to kind of see the beginnings and then I'm gonna show you what it looks like now. This was taken last summer. Um, so there's, there's an er actually early summer. So I'm, I'm thinking it was probably May. I'm gonna say, and then this was in the fall. So this is what it's looking like now. Um, actually been about a month ago. And so what you see here is this real drought tolerant plants, this rockery gathering water and pushing it, and kind of holding it into this planting area rather than having it run off into the street. And then I thought I'd give you a tease of what plants we did put in here. So these are real drought tolerant because as you can obviously see, it's very open, there's no shade, that no shade trees around it. Um, and also, um, there's a lot of heat off the sidewalk and off the road. That's what that's why they're called drought tolerant. There's a lot of that stuff that goes on in between. That's that's a bit of a, a hot area for plants to grow. That's why lawns kind of tend to need a lot of water in those. So rosemary, uh, lavender autoquast, lavender munstead, two different varieties of lavender for a very specific reason. Autoquast blooms early. And then when autoquest is done blooming, Munstead will begin to bloom in the middle of the summer. So you get a double lavender bloom on that. And then the Rebecca Goldstorm, which is one of my favorite little Rebeccas in the garden. That's that um, really vibrant gold that you're seeing in the photo. And then Sedum Autumn Joy, you can see it starting to show its autumn moment in the photo on the right. Um, so you can kind of see the seasons that happened in this garden. And it was just really, a transformation that uh, we made in this very small space and it was a way to really drive water where we want it and to be much friendlier because imagine um, what if we went to here let's go back to there imagine uh, where pollinators would come where all of that joyful environmental things that happen in the garden where would they go here uh, they would move on they would find somewhere else to go and this is where they would hang out. This is what they would want to do. And so there, there's a little bit of inspiration for your um, so-called health strip. And so then we're now going to bump into container gardens. because I think this is the ultimate downsizing, the ultimate small garden, is putting plants in containers. And what containers allow you to do is basically garden anywhere. If you don't have a chunk of soil in the ground, find a place to put a container more than likely. And so I'm going to go through some ideas for containers, but initially the, the, the first things we really need to know is the care and keeping. And so how a container drains is very important. There's that water thing again, we're going to go back to what we, we talked about in the beginning is, is water is actually something important to do in a container garden as well, because it needs to drain out of the pot. It needs to not be bogging up the plants in the pot. So drainage is vital, making sure that you have a drain hole. And then watering when dry. So this just might be your, your kind of moment of interaction with the garden is just basically dry watering, unless you have a lot of containers. And you might talk about a drip system in them, but really looking at how you don't have to overwater them. You water them when dry, um, so then you don't saturate them. I think most people kill container gardens much love they give them too much water and then the container and the plant just fail the plants fail because they're living in a bank of water under there and then potting soil to me is another again just like i talked about the soil in the earth that you're taking care of get a nice organic potting soil i'm not a fan of potting soils that have a lot of um, auxiliary ingredients like uh, wetting agents or fertilizer or anything like that. I like a really good organic potting mix and they are out there on the market. You can find them at your local garden center. And so if you want to add fertilizer, instead of what the package gives you, get a, a potting soil without it and add in your own organic fertilizer. And add in, so then you are the quality control expert when it comes to your potting soil. And so making sure that it's, it's really healthy, good potting soil. So starting in a new container, new potting soil is absolutely imperative. 
it's just like you do in the ground. You want to have a really good start and something for these plants to live in because they actually have to live in this and try to get all of their water, their nutrients, everything, all of their lifeblood that their roots and the plants need is in that soil. So you might as well start it good because then the soil will be much healthier. And a little bit of seasonal care of a pot. Um, you know, there's, there's winter, spring, summer, and fall. Basically, um, the, the little blue pots in the, in the corner of the slide, kind of not my winter thing. <laughs> You're gonna leave them like that, at least clean out the dead stuff. Um, you, you can clean that out, top them with some beach glass or something fun or some gravel and, and just kind of make it a really nice effect or plant it with some winter things. We are in a, a really nice climate if you are in the Pacific Northwest, watch from all over, but if you're in the Pacific Northwest, we have plants that do well all winter long here. And so, you know, kind of cleaning out any fading or dead plants so that those aren't harboring bugs and disease and things that are kind of come back into your pot. Replace the soil if they're empty. And then, um, you know, top dress with compost if you want um, in the spring and kind of let some of that top dress get down into the soil as it's starting to so really remembering that you can't just plant a pot, uh, put it on your deck or wherever, and then you know let it just go. You need to take care of it. You need to either clean it out if it's all annuals or switch out and make sure things aren't root bound and, and all of those things. So making sure that you do know that it's not zero maintenance for a container garden. You really do need to have some sort of care that goes with it all for sure. And so then at the container, to me, this is like that really fun design moment. Let's, let's design a container. Let's do something really fun. And so you can pick color, you can pick sizes, you can pick all kinds of things. To me, um, containers are just a little element that maybe you can't have a lot of color in the garden. You don't have the space to grow something. So put a big, vibrant pot in the garden. That's the color that you're after. And then you can plant it up. And so kind of think through containers. That's just a really fun moment. A little bit of kind of housekeeping on what size. Um, start at least with a six inch pot, even on your windowsill, anything smaller and whatever it is, even if it's just a simple annual can outgrow it. Most herbs and perennials, some of the things that you typically use in a container garden, um, you, can, you can keep them in under 18 inches if that's what your space allows. Um, of course, bigger plants, you want to shade a patio with a tree, you need a big pot to do that. So that's just a few little tidbits on size of planters, things like that. And then mixing planters, um, you know, tall, medium, low. This is just that real classic formula of designing a container. And it's a little more involved, and but it, it helps you to at least start. If you're not comfortable with designing, then go to the garden store and get a tall plant and get a, a medium sized plant, and get a low textural filler and put them together in the cart and kind of look at them and stand back as if they were in a container and go switch out another one if it doesn't look right. And you can see the texture change and the layers and all of those things. And I have a few more plants to talk about that we can talk about in containers. But I just wanted you to kind of have a little tease on how to mix a container for sure. So this was just, a fun container. I was in a um, Earthwise Salvage, which is a salvage place. There's one in Seattle, one in Tacoma, and there was this bin that said vegetables on it. And this is that classic um, old bins that you had in the fridge. I mean, they don't make a metal anymore. That's kind of the old way of doing. Um, and I thought, well, what is that? That's that's a cool container, right? So why doesn't it have veggies in it? So I planted it and put in a bunch of lettuce and really fun stuff. And so that was just kind of who knows what your container is going to be. It could be anything. And so there's lots of possibilities, you know, putting containers in the garden. Maybe they're hanging. Maybe you don't have the space on the ground, but you can hang it. This is a big hanging basket of herbs. Uh, maybe it's just a small tuck of a hanging basket. That hang small hanging basket that you see is an herb garden. And so you can have herbs in your container. And there they go. And or maybe on the wall on this balcony. What is your space? You know, what can you do? Don't set your limits that you can't have an herb garden that hangs or whatever. 
um, you can really discover these spaces. Maybe it's on the windowsill. Um, this is kind of where I'm starting to go right now is what herbs am I going to bring in and put in my windowsill so that I can have freshness for the winter. And so you need to make sure that you have a really nice sunny window and that it stays warm in that. So if the window gets too cold, you may have to either add auxiliary heat mats or kind of um, get some air in there so that they can be warm because you need to think about whatever you put in your windowsill um, or out on the kitchen counter, whatever that is, what does it like outside? So if it's a rosemary, it likes cold, sun, hot. So then you need to find a place inside that can kind of mimic those conditions. Whether it's an auxiliary lamp, I actually put um, a decorative floor lamp over my plant area, which I'm pointing to, you can't see. Um, so it adds, I put in a, a plant bulb in a decorative floor lamp, so that it adds the auxiliary light I need without looking like some sort of science experiment with a crazy light bulb thing in there. Um, and then, you know, kind of top again, tabletop gardens. I really just wanted to show you that I don't think there's limits to what you can do if you want a, a small space and you want to garden there you you can find a way to garden even up on a roof this is a really fun rooftop that we did in canada that i just did up there and these are grow bags and so you can see these climbing uh bean beans going up the poles in these little grow bags so up on a roof is that if you have a roof maybe that's all you have what can you do you're not going to haul a big heavy ceramic pot up there but you can use grow bags or lightweight so, you know, kind of thinking through, everybody has a space, where's yours? You know, where would it be? Um, even these fun little, like, I don't have space, but I need an address marker. So let's just plant that too. And, and you know, put that in front of the house. So uh, the UPS guy can deliver to you or whatever, he can find your address. It just happens to be a very useful space for everybody. So fun idea there. Um, and then this palette, you can, you know, I'm giving credit to where I found this. Um, idea, so you can jump on it and get that idea from her, but it's a pallet garden and I don't like planting directly in a pallet. That was kind of a real popular thing a, a few years ago and you never know where that pallet's been. So just don't plant in the pallet, but what a fun idea to create a shelf garden. And so you could put this on a balcony, you could put this on a patio, you could put it on the side, create like a retaining wall, or not a retaining wall, sorry, a privacy wall. So you don't look at the She's got this kind of cute little fence that grows things. Um, so here you go, expressing like, what, what are your limitations? I don't think there's very many limitations. And then of course these horse trough planter or horse trough waterers, which you could get at farm stores that are very popular right now as galvanized uh, veggie gardens. So you can create a raised garden where you don't have a raised place in your garden, you know, a soil that you can grow in. And I love the idea, the larger photo that you see, I, I wanted to share that with you because those are on rolling casters. You can roll those around and maybe if it's like, it's sunny, I'm gonna move it over here. It's probably a little heavy, but you can roll them where you want them and maybe kind of switch up things a little bit and keep them a little more mobile because if you have one of these, you already know they are very heavy. And so you, their home is permanent until you empty it out. And so if you want, you know, you, rolling method. I think that's that's kind of a fun idea. And then this, you can see the credit of where this is taken, but this is fun. These are those galvanized containers. So if you're not a metal, tiny metal person, you can actually get a paint and there's um, spray paint for metal um, that you can spray the color and, and kind of really make this exciting. How exciting is that? I think that's really cute. Um, oops over real quick. This is more of the grow bags on the roof garden. Again, a lightweight way that you can have um, some, some real purposeful food crops, herbs, whatever in these gardens. And so you can put them in these bags. They're basically like a heavy felt and you can use them every year. And then at the end of the year, uh, harvest all the goodies out of it and put the soil in your compost bin and rinse out the bag, let it dry, store it away, and then get it out the next year and grow some more in it. And then it won't rot down over the winter. They take a long time to break down, but it's sometimes a way to rescue. Comes and goes. Um, here's a sweet little 
really downsized gardens with just the chard and some thyme and the mint. And, and, and as you can see, we're just really kind of what is your space? There's a window box hanging over a deck. It's right on the deck railing. And so if that's all you have is a deck railing, then you can have it too. And that's that's really what what this kind of inspiration is about is how you really make it feel like a garden as well. It's like how you place the pots and how you position them and how you plant them and how you line them up in a row. This is that kind of um, going back to a slide when I said repetition and harmony. Look at the repetition of those black pots. You can have as crazy clutter of plants as you want in the in in the pots themselves, but the pots are the harmony. The pots are the the kind of release of not too much clutter. Kind of this is a fun idea. It's the end of a patio. And so it just tells a person, it, you know, either by the, their kind of sight line or that they know that they can't tip over the back edge of the patio, because this is kind of creating a barrier to do that. So they'll fall over the edge and, and um, kind of not come back because they don't like your patio. So make it more inviting so you can put plants in. And of course, this feels like a garden, right? It isn't just all sitting on the ground. There's some up and there's some low and there's some var variety and texture and all of those things, that's what we're looking for. Just how do we create our space and create it into a garden? And so as we kind of bump through, I, I hope you have some inspiration. What the next moment that we're gonna go through is really let's talk. Um, we have some logistics things we've talked through. We know how to kind of start a very healthy, um, environmentally friendly garden and so and you've discovered your space i hope i hope in your head you put something in there so now we're going to talk plants but what i want to say is i'm looking at the time it's 7 26 and what we'd like to do is give you a five minute break and so you can run and, and refresh your teacup and i'm going to take a sip as well um, and so if you want to come back in five minutes 7 27 um, 28, 29, 30, 30, so 7.30-ish, 7.32-ish. Um, I will start going through some plants, but I just wanted to give you a chance to go and take a quick break. So we're gonna just kind of go quiet for a minute and then come right back and we're gonna get through some plants. Thank you.
Okay, I hope you're all back. If you hear my voice, come running. We're gonna <laughs> get through some more things for you on this screen. So um, now we're gonna talk a little bit more about plants. And I did take a quick peek at the, the question and answer, and we'll, we'll have some time at the end for a few of those because I would love to answer some of those. But there is one I can touch on a little bit as we go through plants. So um, now that you've discovered your space, we're gonna talk plants. So I always do get asked, what am I gonna grow? And I always say, grow what you love. If, if you like a lot of rosemary, then grow rosemary. If you like a lot of kale, grow a lot of kale. Whatever your uh, thing that you love, then grow a lot of it. If it's edibles, if it's herbs, if it's again, a pollinator, purposeful, aromatherapy, you know, what is kind of your thing? That's what you're going to grow. And so some of the things that you can look at in small spaces, and mostly what I'm going to run through is containers, uh, but it kind of shows you that small space. And I think one of them is potatoes. A lot of people think, well, I can't grow potatoes. I don't have room for them. Potatoes in containers are amazing. And you can get a lot of little baby potatoes um, out of a, a pot, just like you're seeing there. And it's actually not too unattractive. So the thing to remember about potatoes is, uh, when the plant, so it looks great and lush and green, and all of a sudden it starts to look ugly and die and like something's wrong with the, the plant itself, that usually is the indicator that the, the actual, the potatoes are ready to pick, that the, the, the vine is dying and the potatoes are ready. And so then you can harvest all those potatoes and then you can plant something else in the container. Um, carrots and radishes, again, some people think, well, can you, yes, you can. You can grow those in a pot or in a small container, um, in, in, in a raised bed. But in fact, they do a lot better in raised beds because of the drainage and there isn't anything restricting them to become really great root crops. And so you can plant those and actually you could plant a crop of radishes right now if you wanted. I think, I think we're, we'll probably have enough uh, season left that you can get a, a quick, quick crop of radishes and spinach and things like that. So once you harvest like those potatoes or whatever, then you can go ahead and, and stick in a, a, a cold crop. And that was one of the questions is you can do spinach and lettuce. We still have enough time to get a really good quick crop of young lettuce, things like that. Um, and then what's going on right now in the industry itself is a lot of seed suppliers, plant suppliers are really stepping up to the game knowing we want smaller growing things. We want lots of things to grow on a small plant. And so you can see here's a few cultivar or varieties of seeds you can buy from Renee's garden. And super bush, you can see in a tomato, a, a tomato plant in a container, really super productive. Baby bell, those little, I, I don't know if you guys have bought those little baby peppers in the store. I love them as a snack and they're kind of pricey. So you can grow them in a container and because they're smaller, they don't need as long a growing season, you can still get a decent crop out of them. And then even little cucumbers. And so you can see, you don't have to have limitations. Strawberries, you probably very familiar with strawberries in a container. Um, this is super abundant to just have them overwhelming the container. Every year to a season, maybe two seasons, you're gonna have to go in there and take out some of those baby strawberry plants and either compost them or make another container or use them as a ground cover somewhere or something like that, but you'll have to kind of deal with that a little bit. Um, but why not in a container? You can have fruit and, you know, even one of these little um, alpine strawberries are one of my favorites. They're absolutely tiny, tiny. So it's not like you're going to make jelly out of these. You're not going to get enough for one thing and they're so tiny, but they are so power packed with flavor. They're just absolutely like candy. And so I love to throw in seeds of these and get these going. You'll do that in the spring, but this is one of my favorite little kind of fillers around pots that around the edges of the pot, it can hang over, it looks really nice. And then again, the industry is kind of saying, oh, people are downsizing, they want small spaces. And so we're starting to see a lot of varieties of fruit that you can have in small spaces. So we have Top Hat is a blueberry, Sunshine Blue is a blueberry, of course. And then Raspberry Shortcake is actually, I have all of these in my garden. And um, I have to say that Raspberry Shortcake is quite a little producer. 
it really put on a lot of berries this year. And uh, but one warning, it, it does spread just like the, the, the canes that you put in the ground. You have to be a little bit careful because if it gets out the, the bottom holes um, or you kind of, I actually put it in a raised bed and I thought it'll be fine. And now it's kind of taking over everything. And so just be careful about it, keep it contained. Um, but super producer in a very small plant. And Sunshine Blue, this is one of my favorite little blueberries. It's a dwarf, the heavy producer. And here's the magic behind it. It's actually an evergreen plant. And so you could use it like a nice little hedge around the veggie garden. Um, you could just you know, tuck it in as kind of a filler in a container. It'll look good all year. Um, in our climate, it stays really nice. And so, and it kind of gets actually a nice bluish cast to it in the cold weather. And so don't feel like you're limited by fruits. Even apples, if you haven't seen these yet, um, they're actually a real kick. I'm picking mine now. I have two of these in my garden and I have ha had a lot of apples this year. They're very productive. They're like a flagpole. They're, they're actually they're kind of an old fashioned name for them is a flagpole apple. And they literally grow straight up and down like this. And the apples produce, just like you see in the photos, these big clusters all up and down the tree and so then you can get quite a nice harvest you're not going to make you know bushels of applesauce or you know whatever you're not going to do that but you're going to get a pretty nice crop the other nice bonus on this is um they actually don't need a pollinator so they will produce her fruit they're self fertile they do better with another one so if you want to do a couple of columns like you can see on this deck, you can pick fruit from the upper part of the deck or down from below, go straight up and down. It gets about 10, 12 feet tall. Uh, mine are about eight feet tall. They've been in a container for many years and heavy producers, so just really fun. And so if you thought maybe I can't have a fruit orchard um, or I can't have fruit in a tiny little space, yes, you can. Here's another one of my kind of little watercolor sketches. Um, you could choose one of those um, galvanized horse trough, watering trough containers and put a columnar apple in the middle, a couple of raspberry shortcakes, um, and then some sunshine blueberry and tuck in alpine strawberries all around the edges. And you have this mini little fruit orchard, little fruit garden um, in a very, very confined space. This would only probably be like a two by six bed, um, three by six at the most. I mean, plenty of room to make to make a little mini fruit garden. And then microgreens, this is a, just kind of a hot thing that's going on right now. Um, microgreens are really just a mini little garden moment where you can take seeds of basil, arugula, uh, lots of the, the leaf lettuces, and you let them get up to about two inches and then you cut them all down and you eat them and they're very trendy and they're very fun. And my favorite way to utilize microgreens is, is as you're, you know, garden is kind of going down for the winter and you're downsizing in your house to, to smaller pots. If you grow microgreens in the house, then you have fresh basil flavor and fresh parsley. I really like a parsley microgreen um, that you could just slice off and then just reseed again. And so it's kind of a fun thing. And there's more on my blog about microgreens if you want to, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then when you're kind of building pots and colors and and things is, is playing with color and form and texture and kind of really, you know, adding in textures. And you can see what these are, are very purposeful plants. We have pineapple sage, we have the variegated sage. These are all sages that you would use in cooking, um, yet you could make this amazing container um, and, and have lots of lush color. So don't think you're just kind of limited to the green of, of basil or, or whatever, you can see a lot of texture with some of these herbs. And I wanted to take a minute on the, the container on the right, the, the darker terracotta container. Um, somebody did ask in the question and answer um, box about plants that you could put in outside right now or a container you could probably plant. So what you can plant are these hardy herbs, like you can plant parsley and thyme and sage and rosemary and mints, and they are tough enough to get through the winter. Um, and that, you know, if we don't have a really hard winter, you do a nice packed container with these and 
stick it up on the deck and you'd be able to harvest some of this through most of the year. So look for these hardy herbs and most of the nurseries, the larger nurseries in the area are, are, are still carrying enough of these hardy herbs. They may not have a lot of basil and things like that because we're really going out of season on those, but you can still kind of get um, some of the good stuff that you can utilize through the winter and have a little bit of a winter pump as well. This is another little quick sketch. It's a container garden. It's basically your spaghetti sauce garden, right? So you can have a La Roma tomato. That's a really nice dwarf little Roma tomato. And then some basil and some parsley and then some oregano. Hot and spicy is my favorite. Put this in a pot about 24 inches in diameter. It'd be nice if it was 24 inches tall. So you kind of have enough space for everything. And you can have a little mini um, spaghetti sauce garden. So, you know, thinking about that, and here's another texture thing. Um, this is all this dark foliage you're seeing is basil. So you can see amethyst basil, purple ruffles basil. Uh, I used these this year in all my containers that needed annual puck in, because to me, it's just like coleus or something like that, except for I had a really cool plant that I could harvest and put in my salad and utilize. And I had so much of it tucked into different but even when I went out and harvested for use, I still had enough plants around. And so there's that wonderful texture change that you can really look at. Here's some thyme, and these, these are hardy enough that you can find these and utilize them in containers this, this time of year. So silver posy, um, foxley is the big creamy variegation, bigger leaf than most times. This is one of my favorites. It's really nice to drip over the side of a container, or around a, a rock wall or something like that. I mean, it's just really a nice look to that. And then a useful garden. Here's another purposeful moment, right? Where maybe it's not necessarily food, which I talked a lot about herbs and veggies and things like that. Maybe you're really looking for a, a way to support the environment, maybe support pollinators, but you don't have the space Grow. So this is an old vintage wheelbarrow that I have. And so then I put in all of these pollinator herbs. So I have some echinacea white swan. I have walker's low hot mint. Um, there's a lavender in there. You can see the hummingbird mint, which is that blue spike you see up in the corner. And so then think about this. If you have an old vintage wheelbarrow, which a lot of people have these in their garden for decor, then you can roll it where you want it and kind of Find a nice corner where you want to see some butterfly activity, some hummingbird activity, all of those things. So as we've kind of gone through all of this, um, you can really see that there's not limitations to a small garden. That was really what I wanted to share throughout all of this was how we don't set our limits and how we don't set boundaries. Um, so as we kind of wrap this up and we have time for some question and answer, um, these are the things I really want you to remember. So no matter where your garden, no matter what size, big, small, on the windowsill, whatever it is, don't set limitations until you have to. And so if you don't have enough sun, you're going after shade. If you don't have the space, you need a smaller pot, whatever it may be, don't set the limitations until you've identified your space. You get to know your space, you make the best of it. And then water, soil, all of those things we talked about, low maintenance, those are all just things we have to do as gardeners right now. We have to take care of our soil and our water and the environment that we want our food to grow in. We want our pollinators to be healthy and um, very, you know, very robust in their populations. We need to take care of how we garden. And, and we talked a lot about you know, good soil and all of those things, right plant, right place. There's that thing I want to kind of tattoo to your forehead, you know, pick the right plants to do the job that you need them to do. And then really just remember yourself in all of this, right? The personality. Do you want a place to sit and read? Uh, see if the garden space will allow you to do that. Do you want to grow lots of food? Lots of containers of food. You can do a, a fruit garden, a veg garden, all of those things. So you could just really infuse. So those are some things I want to leave you with your Member, so to speak. And then some quick resources. Um, Walt talked a little bit about these, but um, these have some resources for you if you want some um, natural yard care tips. 
And you saw a lot of them in this. And then Puget Sound starts here, how we're really taking care of every time you go to maybe Prince Hawaii Park or down on the waterfront, if you live in Tacoma, wherever, how are you taking care of that beautiful water that you're looking for? So Puget Sound starts here dot org has some really great resources for that and one last thing i wanted to share with you i'm so excited to share and then we're going to go pop back to video for some some chat time i'm releasing a new book it comes out the first week in december um, there's also my website here you can see listed if you have a question and maybe something we don't get to in this question and answer time then um, just feel free to email me or if you want um, maybe a snapshot of one of those little watercolor things I did. Um, just, just get a hold of me. I'd be, I'd be happy to share kind of all the things that we talked about. Um, so, and, and then I'd love for you to kind of take a peek at my new book. That's kind of fun. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pop back to video and I'm gonna ask Walt to unmute and um, whoever else wants to read off some questions so we can do some question and answer time. We are. Great. Well, we do have a few questions. Hi, everybody. Um, that was awesome. I'm just, it makes me so excited to get back out in the garden, nice. even though it's pouring down rain. <laughs> All right. So our first question is from Kimberly, and she asks, please list some plants we can put in the ground now for winter gardening and nice. any local nurseries that you know of that are selling winter garden plants. So yeah, and that was the question I kind of alluded to a little bit when I said, you know, those art, those hearty uh, herbs like parsley and thyme and things like that. And, you know, right now, kale, spinach, um, we still have some thyme. You could get some microgreens and some kind of low cut um, fresh greens going right now. Easy to do. You can get a crop of radishes. And as far as what nurseries are saying, so a lot of nurseries do kind of go into what I call a dormant period. They're not carrying as many plants, but there are some larger nurseries in the area um, that will carry things like Watson's and Portland Avenue Nursery, if, if you're in Tacoma. Um, and I'm trying to think of some other ones, and I'm sure somebody's going to pop up and tell me some other ones. Bassey Nursery is another fun one to go to. And I would just, I just would wander through and support those local nurseries. Um, I think Willow Tree Gardens is one over here. I'm on this side of um, science. Uh, so that's another one. So, so look for some of those hardy plants. And because they're, um, you know, they're nurseries, they want you to buy their plants. They're going to have plants in there that are going to be okay this fall. So that's something to look for. Awesome. All right. Our next question is from Mary. If you create garden beds on both sides of a picket fence, how can you keep weeds from growing under the fence? Um, she's concerned about putting mulch in the fence um, eventually rotting. So sure. how would you do that? Sure, and that, that's a good idea to, to really consider what the mulch and the, the soil would do to the wood after so much years of rain. So I would, you know, consider what a barrier would look like. What would stop weeds from traveling under the fence? And a barrier would be maybe a beautiful river rock gravel stream that you could kind of put in a, a little, build a little four inch trench or so and fill it full of beautiful river rock underneath the fence. So the fence is protected from having soil, but also the, the weeds will have a hard time creeping under there. So, or, or maybe there's some beautiful brick or something that you could create an, a decorative edge. I would kind of look at what's kind of a hard line that weeds will not find very friendly <laughs> to creep into. Uh, that's, that's really what I would do on that. Awesome. Um, so we do have a couple of questions popping up in the chat. Um, if you can put them in the Q&A, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. If you could put your questions in there, that would be awesome. Just so I don't miss any. Um, okay, our next question is from Lois. And she says, the garden with the deck, hot tub, and wall. Did you put something along the back of the raised bed to keep the dirt off the neighbor's building and garage? Yes. What did you use to keep the dirt off adjacent buildings? So yes, we did. And a, a couple of things that you didn't see in the photo. So we did have to be very careful. That was one of actually the requirements 
with the HOA that we obviously didn't, you know, do anything to harm someone else's house, nor would we want to do that. So um, what you didn't see in the photo was the, so the wall is here and the land sloped just a little bit. So it did slope down to the, the home on the, the neighbor's home. There is flashing along the, the base. And also there was about, I'm going to say it was about 12 inch wide band of river rock right along the house, the neighbor's wall, so that, you know, if soil slid, it, it, did, it would slide into the rock and not necessarily into the house. We also put some flashing, so we wanted to make sure and protect it. But really, there is not a lot of soil piled up there in the first place because the way that the, the level of the soil was. All right, we've got two questions about slugs. How do you control slugs that hide under the pots and nooks and crannies? And then Elizabeth says that she lost all of her basil to slugs. So what would you do about that? Oh, it breaks your heart to lose basil to slugs. Um, so I, I guess a few things I want to say about slugs, especially in pottery. So I tend to like to see pottery and all mine are up on pots. And so basically, you know, you can set them on a, a little brick or something like that so that the slugs don't actually kind of get up and kind of into the drain holes and stuff. It's a little harder for them. They're a little more exposed if you've got a little airspace between like your deck and the pot. And so you put, you know, decorative pieces of pottery or, or whatever, however you can elevate. So that's, that's one way to keep them from really creating like a, a, a party underneath your pot because they get a little crazy. And then I am a fan of organic uh, type of slug controls. Um, use them very cautiously as you know the, um, the label will say, but something like sluggo, which is natural, it's not very strong and harmful for the environment. Um, and you just kind of sprinkle a ring of those around a pot. Um, the basil, yeah, they probably said, thanks for that. That tasted really good. That's uh, just really unfortunate. What I would do on a basil, um, and the basil would appreciate this, is in a pot, you might consider popping the soil with like the beach glass or with um, like a beautiful white crushed rock or something like that. The basil will appreciate kind of that heat that drives off of that substance, but also the slugs are less likely to go across that, that kind of icky surface to get to the basil. That's what I would do. And then I'm a, a a big fan of, of control. So in the spring, when all the baby slugs are hatching, that is your time to get out there and control them. If you're looking at controlling them later in the summer, you've waited too long. You want to get population control. <laughs> so do it in the spring early and you'll find less damage in popping them through the summer. All right. Next question we have is about sentinel apples in containers. Mm -hmm. Do you root, prune, and repot? How often and what fertilizer do you use? So specifically on those, those sentinel apples, which is a, a, cult, or a, it's a, it's a variety of that flagpole apple that I showed a picture of. Um, so I've had mine in pots for, gosh, eight or nine years, um, and I've never done anything to the root. I've never had a problem. They're not root bound. They're not problematic. My pots are big, so they're probably three feet by three feet. So they're good sized pots. The apples are perfectly happy in there. And I've covered the soil with strawberries. So that helps you know, them look pretty in there as well. Um, and I just use um, an organic fertilizer. What I, I do in the spring is I top dress the apple uh, pottery with compost and then fertilize through the season as needed. They haven't really, they're not really too uh, high maintenance. They, they don't take a lot, of, a lot of care. So I use just an organic fertilizer, a fish fertilizer in a liquid form, whatever your favorite kind of organic fertilizer is. And I only do it once or twice if I need to, but I think this year I'm gonna say I was a bit lazy and didn't do it. And they have been very productive this year. Um, so they're, they're just a really nice plant. I, I think that um, if you're in too small a pot, you might have to look at you know, root pruning or, or bumping them up to a bigger pot, but start out in a big pot and let them go and they're fine. 
Right. Next question is from Peggy, and she is wondering about her tomato plants. Can she bring them inside? So depending on what stage they're at, um, yes and no. <laughs> Maybe I get two answers. So you could bring them in, but inside you would need to mimic the environment that makes them happy outside talked about doing that. So they would need lots of light, like they're having a daylight of 10 hours a day or whatever, eight or 10 hours of light a day, like they would be in the summer. And also that they're very warm. And so if you can mimic those conditions in the house, then you can bring the tomato plant in, and especially if it's in fruit, because then you can get some of that stuff to ripen. Um, if you're still waiting for fruit, at, odds are you're not gonna get it in the house. You don't have the environmental activity needed to, to get that fruit to go. And so um, if the tomato is green and you can get it in the house and you can get lots of warmth and light, then your success rate goes way up that you're gonna turn those red <laughs> instead of keeping green ones. But it's not the ideal thing to grow inside unless you really have like a, a, a sunroom or something like that, that you can recreate the environment. All right, we do want to keep those garden fresh tomatoes all year, don't we? They're so amazing. <laughs> all right, next question is from Judy, and she is asking, what would you recommend for a minimum square footage if you wanted to plant a burn pit with seeding? So if you want a, so, so like a fire pit that you want to sit down with marshmallows or whatever, um, boy, minimum size is like 10 by 10. And that's not really allowing you like Adirondack chairs. You have small benches or something like that. 12 by 12 would be awesome. And I'm just kind of going in a square. You want to do a circle or whatever. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, you, especially the fire pit. So the fire pits, sometimes they're three feet, sometimes they're four feet. Um, and so it depends on the fire pit as well. If the fire pit's hogging up four feet, how much more do you need for your favorite chair? So that'll kind of tell you how much farther you need to go out on each side. But boy, just I think anything smaller than 10 by 10, you're just really kind of robbing yourself of being able to gather well around it. Okay, next question is from Patricia, and she's asking if you can suggest a source for privacy screens or trellises. Do you have a great vendor for that? I, I, there's a vendor that I'm just really a fan of right now uh, for metal screens that are decorative with like you know, laser cut in them, really, really pretty patterns. They make them in black uh, powder coated and for 10 steel, the rusty cool steel. Um, it's a company called Veradec, V-E-R-A-D-E-K. Um, just Veradec dot something or um, something. <laughs> um, I love them. I think those are really nice screens and they're really a decent price point for metal. And sometimes that's what you need. Um, also, if you're in Tacoma, if you go to Portland Avenue Nursery, which is a, a really nice nursery, obviously on Portland Avenue, um, they have an area in one of their buildings, kind of in the, right now they don't have a, a lot of plants. They're really kind of winding down for the year. But in, the, in their building, they have like some really nice cedar trellises, wood trellises and fixtures in there. So I would kind of start hunting a local garden store. And then if you really kind of can't find it, Veradec is the cool metal place. That's for sure. That would be my favorite. <laughs> All right. So our next question is from Hammer. And I'm going to be challenged in pronouncing this. So I have a canna lily and a crocus meas. Ozzy Did I do it? <laughs> nice. Okay. In containers. Uh, do I cut them down to the soil and then bring them inside to the garage for the fall or winter? So um, the crocosmia, which not bad, Rachel, not bad. <laughs> that was a good, a good attempt at that. So the crocosmia is hardy in our area. So um, basically, um, you can leave those in the containers as long as the container stays well draining and doesn't freeze up if we get a nasty kind of shock of uh winter 
the Crocosmia is hardy enough. And so you can, just when it's ugly, starting to fall over and you've kind of had enough of it, cut it down and let it be, it'll be fine. You can top dress a little bit if you wanna put some, you know, kind of decaying leaves on top or whatever, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. Now the canna is a different issue. The cannas are less hardy in our area. And I think um, as much as succumbing to cold, they will succumb to rot in the winter. And so they get too wet and then the crown dies and it turns into mush. And so that one, as soon as it starts to get ugly, or we get um, a pretty serious threat of cold freezing weather, then yeah, you'd wanna cut that one down and you can scoot that in the garage and maybe cover it with burlap or something like that. Um, if you wanna kind of overwinter it that way, uh, that will preserve it, but you just need to go check on it once in a while. I mean, it's okay to let it kind of go dormant and dry, uh, but you don't, cannas rot really bad. So that's one thing is, if you can't get it in a garage and you want to try and save it, maybe scooting it close to the house under the eaves where it's a little bit more protected or something, that's, that's kind of helpful as well. Okay, next question is from Patricia. Um, can you suggest natural lawn and yard care that's safe for pets? Um, so natural lawn and yard care that's safe for pets is basically zero chemical. So I'm going to just go there. Um, so, and I don't know if it's, are you looking, I, I think it's like, are you looking for um, different ideas? Like basically like you don't use, um, wherever your pet is going to be, um, make sure that you're not using any sort of chemicals whether it be on their paws or their nose or anything like that. Um, and, and really kind of every organic method that you need to use then it's, it's as safe as you can for pets. So I'm not sure, I mean, there's a lot of specifics like how you would take care of lawn or weeds or that kind of thing. And I'm not sure uh, how deep we need to dive, but go to that website, the natural yard care, I can't remember, was it .org? <laughs> I'm sure Walt's probably gonna smack me for not oh. getting it right. <laughs> but um, they have some really great suggestions for lots of care taking, like integrated pest management, you know, really keeping an eye on pests and weeds and not letting them get away from you so that you don't have to intervene with something stronger than you'd want to, like something non-organic, which would just, we just don't want to introduce a chemical into an environment where children or kids, or actually anybody, bees, everybody. I mean, nobody needs that. So, so however you can choose to, um, and I always just say, what's the pest? What's the reason that you're treating or figure out what the pest life cycle is, what the issue is, and figure out how to not give it an environment it thrives in. And that's kind of an integrated press management thing as well. So, so if this, you have a website for more information. Could I mention too, this is Walt? Yes. Could I mention in two weeks, uh, Lad Smith is going to be a speaker. And Lad is an expert in natural lawn care. So he, he'd be great to uh, tune in to that one in two weeks. Yes, thank you for saying that, Walt, because um, I have been in on a session, a, a lecture from Lad, and, and he's great. So he's the guy to ask that question. For sure. um, so that's awesome. Yeah. All right, what else do we have? <laughs> hey. Okay, so um, the next question is from David. Uh, I am rehoming a hibiscus plant this weekend. Any transplanting ideas? So I guess it depends on the hibiscus, but I, I think we could kind of be general because there's the hibiscus that's like the Rose of Sharon hibiscus, and then there's the big crazy bloomers that are going on right now. So rehoming means I assume you're digging it up and um, transplanting it. And basically the best way is to get as much of the root system as possible and try to do as least damage as possible. And so you're gonna start out, um, as far as the leaves go out, kind of the, the farthest part of the canopy and dig that way and just start carving around until you start to see the root system and lift it and, and transplant it. And this time of year is really good to do that because it's not, it's not going into active growth, it's actually going into a quiet time. And so it'll, it'll probably do better in the transplant. So hopefully that's, um, the, what, what the question was, was asking, because there's a couple different hibiscus to do that. 
All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next, we have a question about the um, galvanized stock tanks that you had mentioned. Um, how do you attach the casters to them? So you have to drill through um, the bottom of it and use nuts and bolts, just like how you would attach a caster to anything, a box or anything. You do have to drill through um, the stock tank. And one, one trick that someone just told me, I thought it was awesome, is um, you do also have to drill drainage holes in those stock tanks. because They, they have a, a drain out for the water, but they don't have necessarily have drainage in the bottom. So you have to drill holes. And this little trick that someone told me was, you know, when you drill into those and like putting the casters on or drilling a drain hole, then you break the galvanizing and you have a risk of rust because you've broke that kind of seal that keeps it from rusting. And so um, someone said, go buy um, a rust-oleum type of spray, um, spray paint, and spray where you cut the drain holes and where you're drilling in your casters so that you stop any future rust problems. So there's a little, I thought that was a great little tip on, on that. But yeah, you just, you do have to drill into it. So you need to get a metal bit and drill in and uh, wear safety glasses and all those things that you're supposed to do. Because uh, it's, it's a little bit of something or get somebody that knows what they're doing when they're drilling metal. It's, it's, it's not hard, but it's not like, you know, it's not easy either. So, so yeah. Cool. All right, next question is from Janessa. Can you recommend a tall evergreen plant or climber that I could plant in a pot to add some privacy? Um, so a tall, so a climber uh, that's evergreen in our climate that would need a supported strellus or something decorative would be uh, evergreen clematis or clematis, however you choose to say that. Uh, clematis armandii is a really nice evergreen clematis that'll climb and kind of still. I also am, am a fan of like uh, camellias that are espaliered. So they're kind of this open habit to them. So Camellia sasinqua, setugeka is one of my favorite. And it has this real open habit that you could plant in a container. It's evergreen, it's beautiful, it's woody, so it doesn't necessarily need something to hold on to. Um, you would just need to be careful that that's not in full hot blazing sun. It would be okay with some sun, but you don't want it to be in, in hot blazing sun. So, so kind of identifying the conditions that you're kind of trying to hide the neighbor with to, um, for privacy or whatever you're doing with that. Those are a couple of ideas. Okay, where do we have some other? Okay, next we have Patricia. Will black and blue salvia overwinter in its container? Uh, maybe. That is a plant that is kind of on the edge of party. Um, and so if we have a rough winter, your container, uh, your containerized black and blue salvia is in higher danger than in the ground. Um, so I would um, keep an eye on the weather but also maybe consider moving that pot somewhere where it's protected. Maybe it's under the eaves or closer to the house where it's out of maybe wind or some sort of, you know, whatever winter is, is really kind of putting in its arsenal right now for us. Um, you just wanna protect it from any harsh winter because it is liable to be lost in a heavy frost or actually a killing frost, 29 degrees or below, sometimes we'll get it and not return. So you have to be really careful in a pot. Okay, so next um, question is about blueberries. Do you need a second blueberry cultivar with the sunshine blue or can you do a hedge of all sunshine blue? Um, so you don't necessarily need, um, it's not a pollinizer issue, um, it, it is, it's a pretty good producer on its own, um, but a hedge of sunshine blue is awesome. I have to say that's a really nice little hedge because it's a dwarf plant, so you don't have to prune it all the time. It's like three by three. That's kind of its size, and so it makes just a sweet little hedge, but you don't necessarily need, you know, two sunshine blues for production. It's, it's pretty good on its own, but 
man, a hedge of them and you're in blueberry land, that would be awesome. I think that'd be fabulous because it's really a good blueberry as well. It's a nice little sweet one. Okay, our next question is from Janet. Um, we planted June bearing strawberries in pots this spring. Do they winter over or do we need to bring them in? Oh, no worries. June bearing strawberries, fine, no problem. They should be just fine in a pot. Just make sure that, um, I don't even think you need to mulch them. I was gonna say, if you wanna put some you know, leaf mulch on them or straw or something. No, they're, strawberries are tough. They're tough as nails. So I, they shouldn't be a problem. I, I guess where my head was going on, on the soil issue or mulch or something is, you know how sometimes when the strawberries get really productive and they start shooting out the babies. And so sometimes the plants will rise above the soil level a bit. And so the, the, the roots might get a little exposed. Keep an eye on that, but if they're all planted in the ground, and I wouldn't worry about having to like diva those and put them somewhere they, you know, they're they're just fine. In fact, they'll probably produce better with a good shutdown. Okay, next, um, Allie is overrun with caterpillars, and they are eating her porch plants. Uh, do you have a natural way to take care of them? So my best recommendation is finding out what the caterpillar is, uh, why it's there. Uh, there are natural products for caterpillars. They're called BTs. And I'm going to say it wrong. It's Bacillus thuringiensis, whatever. And they're BTs. Uh, that's a natural um, killer for caterpillars. But I, I always go to what are the caterpillars and why are they there? Because if they're a beneficial, I mean, they're not beneficial when they're eating all your stuff. I, I totally get that. Um, but I would, I would rather see you maybe uh, try to get an identification, maybe from our extension service or something like that, and figure out why you're overrun with them. Because there's a lot of times when you're overrun with a pest, especially in a small space or just kind of unusual overrun, there's an imbalance in nature. Sometimes. And we need to kind of figure that out and see if you can kind of get to the root of why there's such a population before you kind of take attack on it and then kind of take um, take kind of what you need to do if you need to get rid of them and, and, and use a BT on them or something like that. But definitely the most organic method because a lot of things that kill bugs and insects are just harmful to, they're not selective. And so I always ask what else are you gonna Ladybugs and bees and all that other stuff. So, so just kind of try to see if you can get an idea on what's going on and see if that's, that'll help you out. Okay, next we have Dee, and her question is um, She has an angel trumpet that bloomed last year, but not this year. Uh, do you know why and how do I safely winter it over? So, um, I mean, there would be other questions I would ask. So I'm just going to give a generalization of what you know, I would suspect is angel trumpet uh, likes lots of heat and warmth. And so I don't know if, I mean, but it's not going to be in the hot sun, but it likes a lot of heat. Uh, so I don't know if it was uh, cultural conditions, like maybe it wasn't getting enough warmth, if it was pruned um, at a bad time and maybe you cut off Bloom. Sometimes that happens, not often. Um, and then also, if it was left outside last winter, so this is why it's kind of like what's, what's going on with her environment is if it was left outside last winter and, and suffered some hard damage because we had some pretty wicked winter uh, cold, um, it might have just been really slow to emerge and not had enough time to bloom because uh, they are not hardy. They're, they can be real fussy possibly die if it's really cold. And so I would kind of wonder if the cultural conditions weren't quite right for it to really produce, and not necessarily that there's something really strangely wrong with it. Um, I think that's where I would go first in, in answering that. Okay. okay. Um, we just have a couple more questions. Um, so Patricia wants to know, any suggestions on controlling rampant violets? They are taking over my garden. Oh, the cute little violets. <laughs> um, yeah, dig them out. Get, get a, darn it, get a shovel and dig them out. And don't let them 
go to seed, which they're trying to do all the time. Every time you see a pretty bloom, it's going to be you know going to seed pretty quick. Um, yeah, they're they're not an easy control. It's it's really just keep digging every time you see dig them. Don't put them in the compost pile. Put them away in the yard waste bin, and they'll go to the dump in someone else's yard waste. <laughs> but um, and you could it's liable that you could get you know some seeds or actually some violets trying to survive in your warm compost pile. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it's just kind of a lot of work. It's it's just getting them dug out. That's the best way. There's a better control that I would, would, would recommend. Okay, uh, we have another question about salvia. If it's in the ground, does it need to be dug up and brought in? Depends on the salvia. Salvia is a big plant family. So I'm gonna, so salvia can be like a garden sage, which no party, leave it in the ground. I'm gonna assume if we're talking about a uh, hot lips or black and blue or one of those other type of salvias. Um, again, those are dicey in a hard winter. Uh, so if you want to save it, you want to protect it over the winter, you have a better chance of it surviving. So uh, I don't know that I'd um, d dig it up. I think I would try to protect it in ground. I would leave it because, you know, soil is a great insulator for roots to survive. And so maybe um, cutting it back and covering it with leaf mulch, mulch or um, some straw or something if you want to give it a little extra protection. Um, but it really depends on the salvia. So that would be the better, you know, which, which cultivar, which variety is it? And that, that's what I would ask. Cool. Okay, what is the best, oh boy, what is the best Paniculata <laughs> hydrangea for our area. Nice, you did it good. Paniculata hydrangea. I am in love with paniculata hydrangeas, and if people aren't familiar, so it's hydrangea paniculata. And the thing about the paniculatas in particular that make them really good landscape plants is they bloom on old and new wood, so you don't have to have that fussy like bloom. You know, cut the bloom at this time, but don't cut it at this time. Blah, blah, blah. So, and also they take more sun than most hydrangeas. They're a little bit, you can kind of put them in a pretty good amount of sun in our area. And they also um, are, are not as water thirsty as the macrophias. The macrophias are the big kind of snowball ones. The paniculata is when you say panicle, it's the ones with the big cone kind of flowers on them. And um, gosh, some of the favorites right now, I'm, I'm really enamored with quickfire or Little Quick Fire, which is a dwarf version of it. That's a really nice one. Limelight or Little Lime, a couple of really good ones. Um, they are a bit of the darling of the plant world. So there's a lot of them on the market. You'll see, um, I think Phantom is another one. Someone told me there's one called Firelight. There's one called Lava Lamp. And it's like, I totally want to be a person that names plants. That's really cool. <laughs> um, but I think for like ones that I've just seen rock solid performers when we're designing and putting them in landscapes are like Limelight and um, Tardiva is another one. Um, and then the Quick Fire series. Those are, those are all really good starts. So what else do we have? All right, we just have a couple more questions. So do you have a good source for crushed glass in quantity and coffee bags? Um, I wouldn't say I have a good source for coffee bags. I don't know that. I, I mean, I know it's, it seems like people show up with them and, and I don't know where they get them. So you might like try Earthwise or something, but as far as the crushed glass, the beach glass, like you saw the blue glass in the pot, um, a source for that is bedrock up in um, Seattle. And I actually haven't visited there for a bit. So I, I don't know how COVID has affected them, but it's called bedrock industry. And they recycle all of that glass and they sell it in bulk. And, and they also make really cool glass things. So, so that would be where I would go to get it. Cool. Okay. Um, Peggy wants to know, um, she has been told to place heavy cardboard over the soil in her pots. Is that recommended? Uh, I no, <laughs> um, I'm not sure what the reason would be to do that. Um, 
cardboard over the soil in a pot? Is it to protect it over the winter? To me, what that is is just, uh, or uh, like a mulch or something. Um, I, I just think that's a place for slugs to go and hide underneath. I, I, I and and it, and and who knows what the exchange of air and water and all that stuff that has to happen on a soil surface. I, I, I don't know that. I would want to know the reason why. That's I'm I'm that person. I ask, well, why would you do that? <laughs> what is the reason? So so maybe that's it. But I would I I don't see a reason to recommend it specifically. Fair enough. All right. So our last question: uh, What to do with Rose de Riche that wants to keep uh, spreading? It has spread all over. Interesting because I actually have one that's like spreading all over the place too, and I didn't know it did that. So um, I, I was a little surprised by it. So it's it's some root pruning and some probably some containments, getting it in maybe a nice big pot or something like that. Because um, I I was a bit surprised by mine doing it this this year. Didn't do it in the years prior, and it's only been in the ground about three years. But um, so I I would say you're you're telling it who's boss and doing some root pruning and taking care of it that way, for sure. So yeah, did we get through our questions? Yeah, we sure did. All right, so I'm gonna pass it back to Walt uh, to close us down. Okay, well, first of all, um, I'd like to uh, thank Sue for coming and she, uh, have so much information and get us so excited about working in our gardens and even in thinking about next year and the spring and everything. So that's really cool. Also, I'd like to mention to everyone that this, uh, this uh, presentation was recorded and it will be posted on the, um, on, sorry, it will be posted on the University Place City website as well as the Gig Harbor, the City of Gig Harbor website and the health department website. So if you would like to watch it again, you could go there. Or if a friend, you know, didn't get a chance to see this, uh, they could go there too. And then next week we have Bill Perrigan coming and Bill will be here at the same time, 6.30 next Wednesday. He's awesome with uh, natural landscaping and creating situations where you can work less in your yard, which everybody likes, I suppose. Uh, I know I do. And, and, and go natural without using a lot of, you know, chemicals and things like that. Just so it's kind of following our theme here. And then the following week is Lad Smith and Lad is awesome with uh, natural yard care, but he really can be specific about lawns, going natural on the lawn. So thank you uh, everyone. And I really look forward to the next couple. And again, thanks Sue, you're always, just have so much information for us and get us excited. It's, a, it's pretty cool. I love the container, the stuff you did on containers this time. That was awesome. <laughs> I think you're muted there, Sue. I'm sorry. I am muted. I saw that. <laughs> thanks for having me. I, I really enjoyed it. And thanks for everyone for coming too. So we're going to plant beautiful gardens this year for sure. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. <laughs>